Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's hard to believe, but this past Friday, we celebrated Martha's birthday. My little pumpkin is now four years old. Now, when we celebrated her birthday, we didn't throw a huge party. Instead, our family does small family gatherings. And so we drove up to Denver this time, and we had a barbecue at Grandma and Granddad's house, had some cake and ice cream, and opened a few presents. And it was a very good birthday. Now, my favorite part of any birthday is always the homemade German chocolate cake. And after 20 years, Trish has got pretty good at making it for me. But I know that our small family affairs aren't the only way to celebrate birthdays. Dietrich and Dustin have been invited to numerous birthday parties. And most of them that they're invited to are huge deals. Parents throw these parties at the park or at Pizza Madness, and it is very loosely controlled chaos as 20 to 30 kids all run in different directions at once. And so the question this morning is, how do you celebrate birthdays? Do you have small, intimate family celebrations? Do you have huge parties that are just this shy of mass chaos? Or have you even gotten to the age where you spend the day trying to ignore the birthday altogether? Well, I bring it up because today is Pentecost, and it is the birthday of the Christian church. You see, on this day, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples, and they began to speak in foreign languages. They went out into the streets of Jerusalem. And as St. Luke tells us, by the end of the day, when all was said and done, three thousand people had come to faith on that first day. Now, if you remember our reading from Acts last week, from Acts chapter 1, St. Luke had told us that all the believers had gathered together, and they were only 120 in total. That means that on this first Pentecost day, there was an explosion of 2,500%. Twenty-five hundred percent. That was the power of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the Christian church. Now, as we celebrate the birth of the church here today, as we read through the reading from Acts chapter 2, there are two parts. They're probably small parts and often overlooked parts, but two very important parts of that reading that I want to bring your attention to this morning. And the first comes from chapter 7 of our text. The Holy Spirit has come upon the disciples. They are now out in Jerusalem boldly preaching the good news. And in verse 7 of our text, you see it up on the screen, St. Luke writes, And they, meaning the, meaning the, disciples, meaning the crowds, I'm sorry, and they, meaning the crowds, they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Now the crowds speak these words because they were expecting men from Galilee to speak Aramaic. But here they are speaking in foreign languages. Now that in and of itself is truly miraculous, but it's not the point I want you to focus on. Instead, what I want you to notice is how the disciples were changed and how they weren't. You see, as the disciples go out into Jerusalem, they aren't sporting brand new shiny halos. They aren't wearing gleaming white robes and they aren't flying around on angels' wings. These 12 disciples, as they go out to speak, Everyone recognizes them as Galileans. 
These were the same 12 red-necked guys who woke up that morning. They didn't look any different. Their mannerisms weren't different. They didn't act different. The same 12 guys. Now that's not to say that the disciples didn't change at all, because they certainly did. You see, if you read the story of the disciples from Monday Thursday on, it becomes very clear that this small band of guys were constantly afraid and hiding. Even after Jesus rises from the dead, twice he visits them in an upper room where the door is locked out of fear for the Jews. A third time we read about, he comes and visits them on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. The disciples were so confused about what they were supposed to do next, they went back to fishing. They went back to doing what they had done before Jesus ever met them in the first place. You have 12 guys who are afraid and confused and bewildered. But all of that changes on Pentecost Day. The Holy Spirit descends upon them. He fills their hearts. And now they boldly go out into the streets of Jerusalem and preach Jesus Christ crucified. They aren't afraid. They aren't fearful of being recognized or arrested. They aren't confused about what they're supposed to do. They go out and instead of being fearful, they're bold. They have hope and purpose. They're driven. That is the power of the Holy Spirit clearly seen on that very first Pentecost day. And believe it or not, you have been filled with that very same Holy Spirit. In your baptism, the Holy Spirit came and filled your heart. He gave you hope. He gave you purpose. You are no longer wandering around wondering what to do next. You have been given the sure and certain hope of everlasting life the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has given you a future and a purpose. That is the power of the Holy Spirit, and that is exactly what He has done for you. Now the second thing that I'd like to bring your attention to this morning comes from verse 4 of our text. Again, St. Luke writes, and he says, And they, this time meaning the disciples, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, like my first point, what I want you to understand is probably so simple you pass over it. Now, we've already talked about how the disciples boldly went out and how they were speaking in different languages. But notice, for just a moment, that the disciples actually had to go out into the streets of Jerusalem and preach the good news. In other words, the Holy Spirit didn't descend upon Jerusalem and snap His fingers, if He has fingers, he didn't snap his fingers and suddenly everyone in Jerusalem believed in Jesus Christ. He could have done that. He has the power to do that. But he didn't. Instead, he took the disciples and he put them right in the middle of the city and they preached the good news. And more than just preaching the good news, he gave them the very heart language of the people. 
He gave them the languages so people could hear it in the tongues that are native to their hearts, the tongues that they remembered learning as they bounced upon their mother's knee. The Word of God, it is not some foreign or alien idea. It is not a word that is far and distant or comes from a different culture. Instead, it is very close. It is very near and dear to our hearts. God did not auto-convert the masses, and He didn't even preach at them. Instead, He preached to them, encouraging them to come home to the Father's loving and caring arms. That is what He did for the people of Jerusalem. But notice also what He did for the disciples. You see, God, in His infinite wisdom, God chose to include the disciples and to work through them to accomplish His task. You see, using the disciples to go out and to preach into Jerusalem, this wasn't some fallback position. It wasn't as though, well, everything else is lost, we might as well give the disciples a try. That's not what God was doing. Using the disciples was God's plan from the very beginning. They were His plan A to use fallible, sinful human beings to call to other fallible, sinful human beings and to tell them about the love and salvation that they had found in Jesus Christ. And there is no doubt that God wants to use you in the very same way. Whether you know a foreign language or not, it really doesn't matter. You know, every time I go to Guatemala, I swear that when I go back, I'm going to know Spanish. And here I am two months away, and I still don't know Spanish. But the truth is, God will use me anyway. He will speak through me by His Holy Spirit to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ, and He will use you too. You know, as Lutherans, this should sound very, very familiar to us. We talk a lot about how God works through means. When we talk about baptism, we talk about how God works through the water and the Word to place that Holy Spirit in your heart the very first time. We talk a lot about how God works through Holy Communion working through the ordinary elements of bread and wine to give you the very body and blood of Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and to strengthen your faith. And you know, the truth is, you are no different. God works through you in order to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ. You are not a fallback position. You are not God's plan B for saving the world. You are His chosen instrument. You are God's plan A. I don't know how you celebrate birthdays at your house. I don't know whether you throw huge parties or whether you have a very small, intimate family affair, maybe you try to forget the day altogether. But today is Pentecost. Today is the birthday of the Christian church. The promised Holy Spirit has come down upon us, and you have that Holy Spirit by virtue of your baptism. You are not the same You have been changed. You have been given hope in life. You have been given purpose and a future. And I can tell you that there is absolutely no better way 
to celebrate the birthday of the church than to head out of these hallowed halls and to tell someone of the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.